It's funny that how sound effects in this game can actually play a big part in your game's experience as well. Yeah. And so I think you both know what I'm talking about. But uh, so I think it's cool that even sound has a direct effect of gameplay, even. So I think that's kind of cool. Can you clarify for me off the record which one you're talking about? Sure, I can. Can you tell me? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I right get it. I forgot you can edit stuff. I forgot you can edit stuff. Edit, edit, edit stuff. You can edit stuff. Edit, edit, edit stuff. Edit, edit, edit stuff. Hello, and welcome to the Interstate Gamers Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, a.k.a. K-Slux. My name is Peter, a.k.a. Deal for Real, and I'm also your host. Well, welcome, everyone, to the final episode of Season 3. Woo! And for this final episode, we have a very special and familiar guest helping us out with this episode. So everybody, please welcome Ryan Everett, a.k.a. Rybread. Hey, howdy, guys. Season hey. 3 hype. It's good to be here. Hype. What's going on, man? Super busy with uh, being a high school teacher and everything at uh, my Damn. high school, teaching physics and coaching cross country. But other than that, it's been going pretty well. That's good to hear. Nice, dude. You know, I always say it's it's not a true uh, Interstate Gamer season without a feature from the one and only <laughs> Rye Bread. So uh, here we are coming in clutch, bringing the faithful listeners and the avid fans that Ryan <laughs> feature that they all know and crave. And... Uh, we have a very special game we're going to talk about today, which is, of course, the reason why we have our wonderful guest here. Do you, are you guys ready for me to introduce the game, or is there any more uh, beating around the bush that we need to do? Oh, no. Go go right ahead, my man. All right. Well, this very special game that we're reviewing today is none other than Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Wait a second. This is not Metroid Prime in a thousand year phase on. Hold on. I am I'm the official Metroid expert here. I need to leave. I think I'm in the wrong episode, guys. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> not just kidding. All right. I'm back. <laughs> Believe it or not, Ryan can actually talk about games that aren't Metroid related. <laughs> we, uh, we had this conversation earlier. I got to meet up with Ryan earlier in the summer and uh, he said, yeah, man, I love Paper Mario. And I said, hey, you want to be on the show? And he said, yeah, I'll be on the show. And that was that. And I was on the show, and that, that was that, as, <laughs> as, as it goes. Well, cool. Ryan, why don't you tell us your experience with Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door? Sure. Uh, yeah, so obviously Paper Mario is for the GameCube, and so I got it um, you know, around like 7th or 8th grade, uh, just because, uh, once again, my friend, my friend uh, Brandon McAllister also introduced me to this game, uh, just like he did Metroid Prime. So pretty cool he introduced me to uh, both of some of my favorite games of all time. So I'm really excited Dang. to be here for this episode. It's good friend cred. Right, yeah. <laughs> so no, I started playing it there, and it was my first, one of my first real Mario games and my first Mario RPG game. And, you know, this game has shaped the way I view and judge video games, honestly, for, you know, for the rest of my life. And so... Yeah, I just Dang. fell in love with it uh, throughout the whole process. It took me like a year, though, to beat it. It's like a good year because uh, I got Dang. stuck in several spots and yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to do. And so I took like, you know, a break, like a month off or two months off and all that. So it took me like a full year to beat it finally. But yeah, that's kind of my story. And what a year that was. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. On the total opposite end of the spectrum, this was my first time ever playing the game. Or playing uh, any Paper Mario, really. So I, I've played some of the other Mario RPG games, but never Paper Mario. So this was my first foray. And uh, I had uh, high expectations for sure, partially because of Ryan, but also because uh, The Thousand Year Door is, I would say, one of the most beloved GameCube titles, for sure. And uh, I would say for the most part, it lives up to the hype. I definitely have some criticisms that I'll be happy to get into shortly. But otherwise, I really did enjoy it. And... Uh, before we get into it, Kevin, why don't you take your turn to talk about your experience with it? Right, yeah, so I kind of had a different experience as well. Um, I played the first game on Nintendo 64 a lot as a kid. 
Um, I absolutely love that game. It's one of my favorite games of all time. So a few years ago in college, Ryan had hyped this game up for me. So I was like, oh, I got to try this out. So during Christmas break one year, my good buddy Z-Link, you all know him well, uh, we had a, we had a, we had a good time playing this game and, uh, it was, it was quite fun. Um, not surprising we stayed up multiple nights to play it. Um, but I think we beat it all in one weekend. It was a Dang. lot of Dang. Mario, uh, paper That's Mario. That's actually really impressive. <laughs> Is either a week or a weekend. I know we had to beat it pretty quickly because I had to go back. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to review this game and you'll find me comparing this one to the first game a lot, but just know that I love and adore both of them. So I'm excited about it. Well, cool. Uh, now it's time for some of that traditional P. Willie context we've all come to love and expect. Uh, I hope you guys love it. I certainly love talking about it. Um, Actually, wait, Mario? I wanted to tell you that uh, we need to skip. The, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Almost had a heart attack. Oh, man. <laughs> I actually wanted to tell you our, uh, uh, what is he called, uh, executive producer said to cut this section. So, uh, oh, well, screw that. I don't listen to nobody <laughs> but me. All right. So, yeah, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door came out uh, in 2004. And it was developed by Intelligent Systems, who are also known. So they've developed all the Paper Mario games, I believe. Uh, they're also known for developing Fire Emblem, all of those games, oh. as well as the Wars series, which uh, in North America is known mainly from the Advance Wars game, which was its first uh, entry in the U.S. market. So yeah, they definitely have a lot of RPG cred, and they've they've pretty much been a first-party developer for Nintendo, as far as I'm aware. But they certainly have that pedigree for RPGs, and I think that shows in uh, in this game just the amount of detail that went into just about every aspect of this game. So that's kind of my my trivia this time around. Sweet. Sweet. I will take a brief moment to talk about just the general game flow of this game before we get into the details, the nitty-gritty, the meat and potatoes. Uh, So this game is, of course, a turn-based RPG, like many others. Uh, It's split between the overworld, where you walk around, talk to NPCs, do some mild platforming, and the battles, where you'll encounter an enemy that you see on screen, unlike other games like Pokemon, where they're all hidden in the grass. You transition then into battle mode, which is turn-based, and there's you know some, some stats that you have to keep in mind, but not too many. Uh, different types of moves you can use to attack your enemies, and also to, to uh, defend from their attacks. Uh, the game is divided into chapters, which goes along with the whole like pop-up storybook theme that's very obvious throughout. Uh, there's eight chapters, and each one of those has a overworld area that's distinct, kind of like a dungeon area, and then a boss. And everything in the game is tied together in the hub world, which is called Rogue Port. It's a port town where all these uh, kind of like seedy characters live and, uh, you know, rob people and do all this shady stuff. But it's a very it's a very vibrant town, and that kind of is the the backbone of the game. Like, everything revolves around this town and the people you meet there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the, the game in a nutshell, I would say. Yeah, there's a noose in the middle of the town too. <laughs> there is a noose for uh, for all the hanging oof. that the uh, that the Pianta Mafia does, I'm sure. <laughs> Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. Come on, Nintendo. Anyway, yeah, um, I think that pretty well sums up how the game works and feels and whatnot. Um, so if if I could, I'll just go right ahead and jump into the meat and potatoes because I've been criticized for not saying meat and potatoes. I'm sorry Dang. to my one loyal fan who lives very close to me. <laughs> the meat and potato checker. <laughs> the critics. But um, yeah, I'll jump right in the meat and potatoes and the gameplay, and I'll just kind of take it from there and build upon that. So pretty much the gameplay is one of the things I, I love about Paper Mario, the turn-based style of play and the uh, the ability to incorporate partners and badges and things like that. Um, I really enjoy that because it's a there's a whole strategy involved with with it when you're, you know, when it comes to like, uh, attacking enemies and stuff like that. And I'm starting to realize more and more as I'm playing more games, I'm getting older, um, that I really, I really love strategy games. I think that comes from my dad. He was big into strategy and stuff like that. I mean, he's really good at chess. So it makes sense. Yeah. So, um, this kind of game is like right up my alley. Not to mention it's also an RPG. So there's like customization elements in there and stuff like that. Um, so you can kind of customize the game and play it how you want it. I love that. And I think the mechanics feel smooth and easy to use. I also love that um, the partners have their own bil- abilities to help you outside of battle. Um, it's not just, you know, solely in the game either that you can kind of attack them and approach them. It's also kind of a strategy, right? Because you want to get the first hit in. But 
you also can't jump on an enemy that's spiky or that can shock you. So it's like, oh, well, you have to kind of think about what you're doing. So it's it's very interesting. The game, the way it plays, I I love it. I agree. Um, I think that the I think for me, my my opinion of the gameplay is split between the battle system and the overworld system. I generally think the battle system is really good, but I do have some problems with the way that the overworld works. Um, but I will talk about the battle system first, and then Ryan, I think that'll be a good time for you to chime in with your thoughts on the battle system. Sure. What I like about the battle system is that it's complex in terms of all the little, um, I'll call them micro events that happen. Um, so the battles take place on a stage, a theater stage that has an audience and it has like a uh, set pieces behind you that can sometimes interfere with the battle and the audience members can play a part in the battle. They can kind of power you up or they can, you know, throw hammers at you if they don't like you. Um, there's the badges that you can wear into battle that kind of modify certain parts of the game in really useful ways. Um, but you can only wear so many of them because it's based on this stat and all this sort of stuff. Like all these, uh, all these factors definitely play a part in the battle system and it takes time to learn them. I definitely felt a little overwhelmed when I first played this. Like, oh, there's so much stuff I need to keep track of. But I think over time it settles in really nicely. And what I thought helped with that settling in was that there's very little emphasis on like numbers and matchups and things that like a Pokemon player like myself would come to expect. Like the attack and defense and HP, it's all very, very simple and generally low numbers. And there's not really like type effectiveness. There is sometimes like some enemies don't like fire and some enemies are resistant to fire and whatever but that's kind of kept at a minimum so i think for the most part you can focus on like deciding what exactly you want to do and not worrying about all the math that goes in behind the scenes you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that's something that i really liked about it, it as a nice change of pace from pokemon for example yeah i agree yeah i agree 100 percent uh i guess for me uh for the battle system since we're kind of talking about that i think it's just a really cool uh, blend of RPG elements with real time interaction. Yeah. So it's not just uh, you know selecting attack. Okay. Right. You know goes through or has a you know percent chance of hitting. Uh, no, it's all up to you. You determine whether or not uh, you execute or not. So it kind of keeps you engaged the entire time. Uh, so I I do like your uh, thought process with that, Peter. There is a lot of stuff to keep track of, uh, but it is something that you know you naturally look out for um, as you kind of progress through the game. And the game doesn't like throw everything it could at you right away. Um, it kind of introduces yeah. certain things as chapters move on. So that's kind of really nice from a learning perspective. I think the other cool thing is that you're talking about badges and all the things you can do. Uh, there's so many moves that are you know optional and that really help out with different situations that are not required. And that depends on you know if you can equip them or not. Uh, so that's kind of you know, one of the big themes that I'm going to be saying throughout this game is the uniqueness of the experience for each individual player. Um, I had a very different experience with this game than, let's say, my younger brother Steven or my younger brother Jason. Um, you know, Steven was all in on the badges. Uh, so when you level up, uh, it's not a random, you know, set amount of stats that your you know, Mario powers up with. You get to choose between HP, FP, which is, you know, sometimes you have to use special moves to use. Or the badge points, which is um, how many badges and extra stuff you can wear. I just, you know, I'm a very uniform player. I just did HP, flower power, FP, and then badge points, one of each every time, just alternate. Steven just did a whole lot of badge points. Like he did a <laughs> little bit of HP and FP, but he really stacked the badge points and really made his character really good with that. And I know a lot of other people like to do a lot of FP, for example. Yeah, that's what I did. So there's just a lot of uniqueness uh, that makes the battles and your strategy very different, even though it's the same fight. So I think that's a pretty cool thing about the battle system with that. Yeah, and that speaks to what you were saying, Kevin, about um, the game being one of those games where you can kind of play your own way. It definitely does uh, have those features. My, uh, my funny experience of playing my own way is that I completely forgot I, I kind of spaced out my playthroughs a bit, not as long as uh, the year that Ryan mentioned, but <laughs> definitely over the course of like two months, I probably spaced out my playthrough. But I forgot that you could press the B button with good timing to counterattack. I was only doing the normal guard thing. Right. So I went through the whole game without ever like counterattacking anyone because I completely forgot. And I was watching the game grumps of all people like doing these <laughs> counterattacks. I was like, oh shit, I totally forgot about this. <laughs> the one time I've ever learned anything from the game grumps. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's funny. It was pretty 
It's pretty funny, and um, definitely timing, the aspect of timing is very important. Like with uh, most, if not all, Mario RPGs, I would say, like the original one and the Superstar Saga series and all that stuff, um, you know, it, it is definitely execution-based, as you were saying, Ryan, and uh, that does lend in a new dimension that's absent from a lot of other uh, RPGs that I've played. Yeah, I uh, I agree with that. Um one of the things I I thought was really good, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, but the uh, difficulty feels pretty spot on. It kind of gradually introduces you to more elements, um, like Ryan was saying. Um, so I kind of think it has like a low barrier to to entry for uh, most players. Yeah. Um, but it could still it could still be proved to be challenging at times, especially at the end. But um, it kind of gradually builds you up to that, so people can get into the game and kind of you know get really interested. Um, I had Katie play the beginning of it and. Uh, she was really enjoying it, so um, I think that's a good sign. And um, she, <laughs> when she was playing through the tutorial on the battling system, like she started pressing B to counter. I was like, "Oh yeah!" Like I forgot about that too. <laughs> so it's funny that you say that. I actually went through the my entire first play through the game without using the B counter, not because yeah, I I did too, you know, didn't know it was there, but because I wasn't really confident in myself doing it consistently, like the block one with the A button. Yeah. So I. That was my reasoning for it back then, but yeah, so similar. We all played with a with a similar handicap, it seems. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to I do want to point out um, one criticism that I have, and coming from the uh, original Paper Mario game of the N sixty four, I would say that this game, in terms of mechanics, didn't really innovate a ton and didn't change a whole lot in terms of the battling system. Like there are some few things here and there, one being the audience that really I just I didn't really care for, to be honest, but. Um, it just really, it was kind of the same thing when it came to um, battling. You know, you had your HP, flower points, badge points, and you get your badges and they do different things like let you jump on spiky people or and various things like that. But um, it's really kind of disappointing going from one game to the other. It's kind of like, I kind of wish they implemented some really cool new mechanic. I know they did a few things here and there, but they're mostly minor. Yeah, well, that's interesting because uh, I, I certainly don't have that input. Ryan, I don't know if you mentioned if you've ever played the original. Yeah, that's a, that's something that maybe changes the way that I view this game compared to Kevin. I actually played this game first compared to the original. Ah. And I do agree with Kevin. Um, uh, a lot of people that I talk to about this game, uh, you, a lot of people say, you know, a thousand year door like perfected, you know, what, you know, the original did. Like they've just made it better. They didn't really do anything new too much. I can say though that my favorite thing that this game does that the original doesn't, and it was really noticeable for me going back to the original after was uh, the st- further strategy with partners in this game. Like, partners actually having HP values, you know, they can actually, you know, pass out and run out HP, put them in the front, um, kind of all that stuff. That's something that is not there in the original. It's just Mario taking the hits at the front, and that's it. Um, so there's a lot more of interaction in terms of that perspective. But I, I agree, and that does, you know, obviously I would say... Uh, affect the way that I viewed the game a little bit because um, I did play this game first before the original. Hang on one second. I I I think you can switch your partners to go first in um, Paper Mario in the N sixty four version. You cannot. They have no HP value or anything. They can't block for Mario in front. They can't block for Mario, but they can go first. You can switch them to go. Yeah. Okay. First they can and... attack first. Yes. Yeah. But in terms of like um, taking actual, the hit. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I did, yeah, they do have HP values. So, I do uh, want to voice my my one complaints about the battle system, which is that, and this is a fairly small thing, but sometimes the act of getting into a bunch of battles, like when you're in the middle of a dungeon, I found I found that to be kind of irritating after a while because sometimes just the animations from the battle, like the process of introducing the enemy and like the the literal process of like attacking and then getting your points at the end sometimes it can just take a long time mm-hmm. and this is something that i think i'm kind of spoiled with in terms of the original or not the original but like older pokemon games especially since you can turn off the battle animations like with those i can just blaze through and like just be done with it mm-hmm. but in this game like it feels like a chore after a, like after a while not right away and certainly fighting bosses doesn't feel like a chore to me but like just those repeated enemy encounters kind of start to feel that way just from the timing perspective And what kind of makes that problem worse is that the game punishes you for attempting to run from a battle. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, you have to like do some mild execution to be able to run in the first place. And if you do succeed, then you lose a bunch of coins and the enemy like 
keeps chasing after you anyway, so you might just get caught by the same enemy, which happened to me a bunch of times. You get some intangibility frames to where you won't get hit like immediately after, but it'll take a few seconds. And uh, that, ju- that just kind of felt like something that um, I didn't enjoy. I didn't enjoy being punished for running from battle because I'm already getting punished by losing out on the EXP and whatever items I may get. You know, like It just felt like the game was forcing me to battle too much. Overall, that's a pretty small complaint for me in terms of the, the battle system. We view the same thing with that, Peter. Um, I that was my uh, complaints for it as well with repetitiveness, and you know it's kind of time consuming. It definitely does lengthen the game like artificially way more than it has to, yeah. uh, which makes a lot of the playthroughs you know kind of lengthy. Um, and of course, like the incentive to battle, like I never leave a battle unless it's like dire. My whole first playthrough, I battled every single time because I didn't want to face the consequences of leaving. So I was very similar to that. And when I played Pokemon, and because <laughs> this was actually my really first major RPG ever played in my life. So when I played Pokemon, I left or I could flee. I was like, that's it? No penalty? I was so, <laughs> so surprised easy. that I could leave without a scratch in Pokemon. So uh, yes, that was a very similar critique that I had as well. Pokemon is raising a generation of cowards. You heard her here first. <laughs> I will say that Pokemon still kind of struggles uh, in terms of repetitiveness and like encountering enemies over and over and over again, especially when you're in caves or long areas of grass, right? Yeah. Like you're just like, oh, this is annoying. But that's why there's repels and stuff like that. Most people don't play with the animation settings or don't know that they're there or turn them off, I would have to say. I do want to shift the conversation over to the overworld because I think there's a lot of important gameplay stuff that goes on there. I do agree that, or not agree because I don't think anyone has said this, but I do feel that the uh, the battle system is definitely like what gives this game most of its gameplay flavor, but there is a decent amount of uh, kind of like light platforming, as I mentioned earlier, that goes on, and uh, to, that, to that effect, Mario will get a bunch of abilities throughout the game that enable him to, for example, turn into a paper airplane or turn into a paper boat, and all these other ways of accessing areas you couldn't before, which is kind of neat. It's really fun that they play with the whole paper aspect that way. Um, but I do have some pretty big critiques about the overworld. I found that the depth perception could sometimes be an issue because you are just kind of flat. And I found myself like <laughs> often falling off of the, the edge of the platform that was on the opposite side of the camera because I wasn't sure exactly how close I was to the edge of it. And uh, I also found that some of the jumps are like, incredibly tight for a game that's not really a platforming game. Like, I have to walk over to the very edge. I actually had the same complaint with Shovel Knight, uh, the Avid fans will remember, (laughs) Um, (laughs) where I'd have to walk to the very edge and then jump and hold down the jump button for as long as possible. Like, I I couldn't just tap it. Um, And that, again, is sort of minor, but just over the course of the game, I found myself, like, repeatedly falling off of things or failing jumps. And normally the consequences aren't too bad, but it still just kind of is demoralizing. Like, dang it, I tried to make this jump <laughs> three times and I failed and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that was kind of a an issue I had recurring. Yeah, no, it's definitely a problem. You, it, it is kind of hard to tell. Um, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. In fact, I have nothing else to really add. So I'm just kind of like let you guys incorporate what you want to say. Um, I'm about through myself. Oh, okay. I guess a couple last things that I could add real quick is you kind of touched on the the puzzles that's really clever throughout the overworld uh, and kind of the exploration and some of the platforming as well. Uh, and the puzzles are, I think, are really well done in this game. I know I'll kind of tie this into visuals, but a lot of the puzzles are kind of built in naturally into the environment and they're not very obvious. And and they're not obvious until you realize what their purpose is like later in the game. Yeah. So that's something that's kind of really cool about it. I also really enjoy... Um, the uh, that you're not actually playing as Mario the entire game. Uh, there are some parts where you're able to uh, play as Peach or play as Bowser, kind of see everything from their side. Uh, and so some gameplay element changes with that. So I think that's kind of cool, a uh, little tidbit that they do in there. Uh, I won't spoil really anything with that, but they, that's something they do have in the gameplay. And I guess the last thing, I think it's an actually big plus in this game that I feel a lot of other games should probably do, is that, uh, Peter, are you familiar with the individual uh, Mer Lovely, by chance? He's kind of like that wizard thing in the uh, in the underground place of Rugport. Is she the one who you can pay to tell you where to go? Yes, yes, that's who. So I really enjoyed her in the game. Uh, the reason why is the game does not hold your hand. 
Um, no, not you know, at all. <laughs> it, it can be challenging, but it's not overly difficult. But if you do find yourself getting stuck in stuff like that, you don't have to go online and look up stuff. Uh, there's uh, more lovely that can kind of give you a hint of where things are, obviously with a short, short fee. But, you know, and she can give you hints of like some fun power ups, some of the, uh, you know, power ups throughout the game, or just, you know, where to go in general, like story wise. And it's not like obvious, hey, go here, do this. They're kind of like encrypted messages, like, like nudging you to, to get there. But if you're there and you're stuck, you know, the, the hints make sense. Yeah. And so I think something that really hurts me when I played some RPGs throughout the years is if I take a break for a couple months and I come back to it, I have no idea what I'm doing yeah. and I kind of forget. And so it's just a clever way for the game. If you do come back after a while, you don't really remember what exactly you were doing last uh, that can kind of be uh, a helping block to help you get back on the right direction again. Yeah, I, I definitely forgot about Mer Lovely because of that sort of break I took after beginning the first couple chapters. So I did end up checking Game Facts, but I tried to keep it very brief. So yeah, I, I will admit to that crime. <laughs> yeah, I feel like getting lost is something that happens a lot in a lot of people's first playthroughs, and maybe that's a kind of a crit- criticism of the game. Um, because I feel like I got lost more in this game than I did the previous one. Um, but still, both of them incorporate the aspect of you need to explore and find out what you need to do next. And both of them have, uh, what's her name? More lovely. More lovely. Yeah, both of them have her in it. So, um, I found myself getting lost more in this one, I think, because I think they put more emphasis on hiding stuff than they did in the previous one. Whereas the other one, you had to go around and kind of, just just look carefully or talk to people. It's, it's an interesting aspect of Paper Mario. It's the adventure aspect, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. I think that wraps it up for gameplay. Um, I will give my score first. I gave it a AT. AT. Hmm. AT, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I gave it a 91. Nice. All right. I'm right next to you, Kevin. I'm a 94. 94. Hmm. So we got some good uh, disparity in the ratings there. Should make yeah. for a nice, good average. Um, moving on to uh, everyone's favorite section. Aesthetics. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, kicking it off with visuals, why don't we start with Pete Boy? Absolutely. As a professional graphic designer, <laughs> I'd be more than happy to talk about the, the very stylized visuals in this game. Uh, the visuals I found 100%, 1,000%, absolutely charming. Yeah, uh, just, it's such a fun spin, like on all the Mario characters and enemies and scenery that you know and love. It's pretty funny because before I had ever played Paper Mario, I really knew what it was. I just saw the Paper Mario trophy in Super Smash Brothers Melee, and I was like, "Why is it called Paper Mario?" Like, I, I don't get it. <laughs> and then I play this game, you know, years later, and I see how it's like literally a pop up book world, and everything's like paper mache, and all the characters look kind of like cartoons or stickers or something, you know, all very stylized. I was like, oh, this is why it's called Paper Mario. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I absolutely love it. And because it's so stylized, it has aged very, very well, I found. Um, everything looks really crisp. Even like the user interface is very uh, colorful. And it's just, it, it's very Mario like in terms of kind of the cutesiness, but it's not overly cutesy. It's just kind of like very, you can, you can tell that a lot of love was put into the visuals. Yeah. Um, especially in this game, I feel. And so I'm, I'm a really big fan of them in general. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I've always loved the Paper Mario aesthetic and uh, basically how they've built a world out of paper. And it's just, <laughs> it's so unique and creative, and I love it. I will say, though, that again, kind of to touch on this point, they didn't really innovate too much on that front um, when it comes from Paper Mario 1 to 2. So, with it being a whole new aspect to somebody, it's like, oh, wow, this is so cool. But when you go to the one to the next one, you're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense, right? You're like, yeah, this is Paper Mario. It doesn't feel like a whole lot different, and it's, except for the fact that it's a new place that Paper Mario is going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I will say that, but um, I always found that the original Paper Mario, the fact that it was on the N sixty four and it and it looked like that and felt and played like that, and there were hardly any issues in terms of graphics, was amazing. Agreed. I thought, mm-hmm. I thought, man, this is an N sixty four game. Like, dang, who knew? I was even impressed kind of on that note with uh, 
just how silky smooth this game always felt to me. Like, I don't think I ever once felt any lag or frame drop right. or any sort of hiccup like that. And there are some... Uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of a re- reoccurring theme for just a ton of minions to swarm the screen <laughs> at different points in the yeah. adventure. It just seems to be a thing that happens. And uh, yeah, the GameCube certainly doesn't struggle with it. Not that I would expect it to, but um, it's just kind of nice. You know, sometimes when you play a game on any older system, you think, yeah, it's probably going to lag at some point. But uh, this game, it, I, I don't think it ever did. And that felt very nice. Right. I agree. Uh, I, I agree with you, Kevin. I think my only, you know, kind of complaint, if I had to criticize the visual, is that it, it won't just, like, blow you out of the park or it's not, like, like super overly impressive. Yeah. But it's just super clever with everything that it does. And it starts off with that in the beginning of the game. Like when the boat drops Mario off at Rugport, you know, the boat peels around to leave. Yeah. <laughs> kind of give you that reminder that it is all paper. And I think a very underrated thing that the game does so well is that even though I this is this is going to go in aesthetics because this is not in sound, but there's no voice acting in this game. So everything's done via text box. So what they do in the text box that really kind of helps out is that you really get a sense of like uh, tone from the text in this game. Whether the text is shaky, movie, it's bold, italicized, or even the color, it gives you a real sense that when someone real important or, you know, or bad or, you know, evil or scary is speaking, you really get that dread from that. Just even though you're not hearing anything besides, you know, this, you know, the actual <laughs> music, just looking at the words of the screen gives you that feeling of, of that emotion that you're supposed to feel. So I think that's a pretty cool thing that they do as well. Um, I think the places are super unique. I think it's probably the, uh, a good time to tie in the uniqueness of the places. It is a Mario game in the Mario universe, but I love that they're not really constrained by the typical places that you usually go to. You go to whole new worlds that are just, you know, mm-hmm. brand new that are, you can't <laughs> find anywhere else in the Mario universe, right? They're really unique from being in a wrestling ring on the stage, you know, trying to climb the ranks to a black and white forest with, uh, you know, dim colors and all that. Yeah. There's a lot of cool visual uh, uniqueness to a lot of the places that sets it apart from the other Mario games. I agree. Yeah, that the text thing is a really good point that I didn't even think of. Um, but um, the environments is something I was touching on a little bit. Um, I do agree with the environments. They're impressive, and I love the fact that we're exploring a part of the Mario universe that really isn't like shown in other places. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I love that we can kind of delve more into that and see more, more places in the Mario realm. But I will say that the first one had better places. Don't at me. Uh, I'm sorry. I hard disagree. Now we can't make this whole episode about how the N64 <laughs> game is so much better. I'm just I'm saying. Just disagree. I would say that they're more dynamic. They're more, you know, you're either with like a, an island with a volcano or you're in the clouds with like, you know, I don't want to spoil, I guess we can't spoil, but um, just know that they're more dynamic to me than than uh, the Thousand Year Door ones. I will agree to disagree. The Thousand Year Door hub world is literally one town, right? Whereas the first one is like a whole, like, it's like you have to travel to different parts of the, the country, so to speak. And so there's more tie-in and more dynamic elements to that. So I don't know. You, you could disagree all you want. It's just my opinion. I'm just sitting over here like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ryan, I like what you said about the game being clever with the visuals because that is certainly the thing that, like, definitely drew me in was those clever things like the boat just you know flips around and uh when you reveal a staircase or something it'll peel off of the background or like it'll do some sort of optical illusion i thought that was really cool and um i, I kind of want to see more games do something like that i mean not with paper obviously unless it's a different paper <laughs> mario game but just I, I wonder what sort of cool like you know perspective shifts or you know interesting tricks games could use to reveal stuff like that because that was really really neat the animations in this game were definitely better than the previous they they incorporated some new animations that you didn't see. Like they're not huge and groundbreaking, but they it's a nice little touch. My kind of last comment on the on the visuals is that I love the character designs and also the character mm-hmm. animations. Absolutely. Of course they have to reuse, you know, a bunch of toad NPCs or what have you, but like all the distinct designs I found to be very unique, very memorable, very cute. Um although sometimes some of them are kind of scary, you know, especially the the final boss. 
but I, I just really loved all the all the designs specifically, not just the style, but you know what was represented in the style. Yeah, and uh, that was one of the things I had too. Uh, you know, I think it's really cool that even though there's like characters of the same species, you know, they made him distinctively different. Yeah, and uh, unique, like visually, and that kind of goes with the tone of you know them speaking and all that other stuff as well. And so, yeah, agreed, hundred uh, percent. Last thing I want to say is kind of just to recap. I think um, it's not that I don't think. This one's not unique in its environment and levels and stuff like that. I think they're both unique and creative. I'm just saying I have a little bit of bias towards the old one. But I do want to say that they are unique and they're really good. I'm just kind of expounding on Ryan's point. And it is a it is a positive for the game. Just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> yeah. You because you can you can love one thing and then love another thing even more. And I think that's right. not what you're what you're saying. I guess that'll wrap it up for the visuals. Uh Ryan, why don't you give us your rating first? Sure. I have for visuals a 92. Dang. Nice. Mm. I gave it a uh, 88. Well, guys, I'm sorry to outclass both of you like Whoa. no one's business, but I gave it a hot, <laughs> fresh 100, baby. Whoa. 100. <laughs> yeah. 100. I, Dang. That's amazing. I had maybe like one nitpick about visuals, but it was so minor that I didn't even. Bother saying it because I want to because I want to move on. You know, I want to get this episode out the door. And I was like, you know what? I generally I just thousand really your door. Th- I do want to get it out of the thousand year door. Thank you, Ryan, for that A plus pun. <laughs> Claps. Oh man. But uh, yeah, I I was enchanted for sure. Cool. Well, um, I guess that takes us to audio. Ryan, why don't you start us off? Oh boy, uh, where to begin? Um. So I guess to start off with uh, audio is that the music is just so memorable and catchy. I think the only, you know, kind of complaint that you could have with the music is uh, obviously since you're doing a lot of battles, uh, you hear the battle music again and again. But props to the battle music because as often as you hear it, it doesn't get that annoying. Because if you hear something so many times, it will eventually, you know, get to you. But at least the battle music is still super catchy, still super fun. And um, it's it makes you oh, you're you're usually okay listening to it for a long period of time. Um, the atmospheric tracks from the different places really set the tone uh, and really gives each place um, kind of a sense of feeling and you know kind of you know where you're at and all that. But not only that, I think a clever touch that has with the music in this game is the unique boss themes. The boss music in this game is you know top tier. It is one of, some of the best boss music I've ever heard of any video game ever. And then the last part that's a cool little tidbit that they do is that certain characters, when they have a certain importance, they when they speak, the music has a set thing for them when they speak. And that kind of yeah. adds to the tone and who they are and you know what kind of character they are. And it goes with the text. It all goes along with that. Uh, I This is super early in the game, but the chest that gives you the paper abilities... Um, mm-hmm. you know, when they, when they, when they curse you, when I opened that chest for the first time and it, it cursed me, it was, I was super scared and I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I have unleashed, I have made the worst decision of all time. I almost turned off the game because I thought I was going to die. You know, I thought I made the wrong error that I wasn't supposed to talk to the chest, but that was just because of the text and the music and all that all together made me fear for my life. Even though it's something you're supposed to do, I thought I, I did the wrong thing. So it's a lot of those tidbits I really enjoyed. Quick tangent, um, there is a part in the game where this character will basically tell you, like, you better not do this thing, you better not do this thing, you better not do this thing. And I'm like, what's the worst <laughs> that could happen? So I did the thing, instant game over. And I was like, well, I'm glad I saved recently. I, I went and saved before I did this thing that I was told not to do. And I was like, well, this game actually had the guts to give me a game over. Like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a great part. Yeah. Yep. That's funny. <laughs> on Back on the music, though, I actually, for the most part, I disagree with you, Ryan. And I, I feel bad for saying this. Um, <laughs> generally, I didn't find the music to be very memorable, with some exceptions. I thought that the Rogue Port theme was very good. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes I get I did get tired of it from the repetition because it's a very high energy theme. Yes, and I think that mm-hmm. was a I think that was a complaint I had with a few of the tracks here. Um, yep. But generally, like I you know, given all the time that I spent in these different areas in the game, I feel like there's only 
two or three where I could like tell you now what the background music was. And I don't know. I just didn't find it too terribly compelling. I I will say like the part that (laughs) I feel like this is kind of comical. So I will say the part that I disliked the most musically is when you're in the, the great tree with all the punies I don't really think this counts as a spoiler because it's because it's early in the game. Oh yeah, I agree, hundred percent. That's annoying. When you're in the tree, yeah, it's like da, 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 and I'm like, holy shit, dude! I like <laughs> my TV's already on low. I'm gonna turn down even lower. Um, otherwise, it's not that I disliked most of the music. I just didn't have much an opinion on most of it, except for as I said, the rogue port theme and also the battle theme. I think is a banger. I really, really mm-hmm. like the battle theme, which is good because you hear it all the time. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on the music, and I feel bad for uh, for disagreeing with you in a pretty major way, but that's uh, that's the truth. Yeah, it's kind of funny that you, the from the opening sentence, I was like, "Oh man, I disagree completely," <laughs> but <laughs> but not a, not in a bad way, right? So I think this soundtrack, like I said, it's not. I think it was good, but I don't think it was memorable. I think it fits for like the soundtracks; they fit in the moment that they're in, like you had mentioned. Like they they fit the characters and the place that you're in really well. But going back and listening to it, I was like, I cannot remember a single one of these except maybe the opening theme. Conversely, I know I've mentioned this a lot. This is a repeating theme here, but I I do remember a lot of sounds from the first one. But I will say, I think that's because it had to be more catchy. Because it had less to work with uh, musically, like it doesn't sound as theatrical and uh, as clean as this one, right? So this one has like a lot of sounds going on, which I think is why I don't remember as much. Because you think about some of the old older games that you play, they're so catchy. And I think the reason why is because you know, one, they had to loop a lot. Two, they had less to work with, so they had to make it sound good in some way. Yeah. So that's kind of my point on that. Not saying that either one is really better than the other. I just think they're. Yeah. They, they accomplish different things. Yeah. And then everybody knows I love to talk about sounds. Um, I think the sounds of really both games are pretty damn good. Um, I don't really have much complaints. Uh, they're, they're fun. They're silly at times. Even the text sounds kind of nice when it's like just flowing through. For some reason, that's satisfying to me. I don't know why. It's yeah. Like, I agree. <laughs> oh, yes. You're right. The text sound is really satisfying in this game. Yeah. So I completely forgot to write that down. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so those are kind of my thoughts on the sound. Uh, like I said, more theatrical, but uh, less catchy. Yeah, I I agree with that. The sound effects are very good. I I definitely like the sound effects more than I liked the music, and that goes for all the sound effects. Like from the sounds that that occur when you hit an enemy to the sounds that like the kind of jingles, like when you solve a puzzle and something appears, you know, the paper peels back, it'll go like like marimbas or something. I thought that was great. <laughs> um, my one single favorite sound effect is when there's an audience member who's about to fuck your shit up and you go and smack them and they like, they run away and they just do this real ass like, ah, scream. <laughs> yeah, it's just so, so funny good. and like, it just comes from nowhere. I just love it. Yeah, like the random audience noises I think are really great. Um, so yeah, I would I would say audio wise for me, the sound effects were definitely the, the star of the show to keep up the theater theme. Mm-hmm. I agree. Sweet. Well, anybody else got any more stuffs? Brian, what do you think of the sound effects? You, I don't think you've. Uh, oh given yeah, I haven't touched it on too much. No, I think you nailed it, uh, Peter. Because uh, I didn't want to literally say my whole spiel and let you guys go after. So, but no sound effects. I agree. I think they did a great job with that. Yeah, your example is a great one. Um, <laughs> it's funny that how sound effects in this game can actually play a big part in your game's experience as well. Yeah. And so I think you both know what I'm talking about. But uh, so I think it's cool that even sound has a direct effect of gameplay, even. So I think that's kind of cool. Well, cool, man. Uh, I think we've all said our piece about the audio. So uh, I think, Kev, Kevin, it's your turn to give yeah, your score first. It's, it's Kevin's turn. Kevin will give it an 89. <laughs> 89. 80 nice, man. 80 nice. Nice. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, Ryan will give it a 95. Nice. Very, very favorable scores, I'm noticing. Peter will indeed give the sound effects, or sorry, the whole audio section, rather, <laughs> an 85. All right. Cool. So I think we're literally, I'm in the middle, Peter's on the low end, and Ryan's on the upper end. Yeah. It's cool. all or nothing for Peter. Either he's way ahead of us or a little below yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. well, I, well, it's funny you say that, because I, I found this game to have more like distinct 
high points and distinct low points compared to a bunch of other games I've played recently. So I found it kind of hard to rate, actually. Um, gotcha. Yeah, yeah this so, was yeah. the hardest section to rate for me, by far. Oh. For, yeah. me, for me, the hard section wasn't audio, but it's kind of a pattern that I noticed throughout the whole thing. Oh. Like, man, like, I really like this thing, but I really don't like this thing. So, you know, how do I yeah. reconcile? But anyway, um, enough talk about reconciliation. You can uh, go to church when you need to. It's time for everyone's other favorite section, Cone Tent. Yeah. Oh, man. So I guess I'll, uh, I'll cap this one off. What can you say, but it's, except for it's quite a time commitment, especially if you're wanting to like 100% the game. Uh, you can get lost and stuck. Uh, this is not a negative thing in any way. I'm just saying, you know, if you're playing this game, expect to spend some time on it. Yeah, about uh, about 30 hours, according to my favorite website. <laughs> favorite website. Um, yeah, I, I think this is kind of what really makes Paper Mario shine is its content. Um, both games have, the first two games at least, because I haven't played the other ones, they, they both have uh, top quality content. Um, the story is always really, really, really good and mm. is perhaps mm. the best part about both games. Um, the comedic relief is also the icing on the cake. Um, it brings sort of its own charm to the game. Actually, it brings a lot of the charm to the game where it could be serious. It can, it can fill you full of emotions while you're playing the game. And I think that just keeps you wanting to keep playing and playing. You're like, what could happen next? And you're like, oh, ha ha, this guy's funny. Or, um, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I, I love yeah. this game purely because of the story and all of the characters and the elements that are in this game. Uh, I think it's, it's just stellar. I would say that the story definitely has some interesting, uh, twists in terms of, you know, unexpected things happening or, uh, you know, unexpected foes or allies that, uh, of course I won't spoil here, but, that definitely did uh, get some points in my book. But for me, for the most part, I agree with you, Kevin, that the writing is phenomenal. Um, just so much wit. And so, like, there were some parts where I legit laughed out loud. And if I'm doing anything by myself, like watching a video or playing a game, like, for me to laugh out loud when I'm by myself is very rare. So the fact that this game can do it, I think, is a mm-hmm. pretty big accomplishment. Um, but yeah, the, like, the writing is definitely half of the game's charm, the other half I would say being the you know paper visuals and all that stuff. Uh, what's also impressive is that all of the party members you meet along the way, they all have unique voices, so to speak, as well. So it's very easy to like get a sense of those characters' personalities just from the little interactions like that you get throughout the course of the, of the game. Not even necessarily the big plot moments, but just the everyday stuff. So I found that really enjoyable as well. Yeah. I would say that uh, one critique that I have is um, the game's really long and can be kind of tedious at some points. You can get stuck a lot and not know what to do because it's not clearly obvious uh, as we've mentioned before. Um, so the, cause that kind of increases the time of the game and there's a lot of fetch quests which are kind of redundant. Yeah, It's just not bad. If you like that sort of thing, that's fine. And I'm not saying I don't. I'm just saying normally that gets um, negative criticism. It's just kind of aimless wandering around. At least it's optional though, the, the fetch quests. Right. Right, right. They are they are optional, and I, I actually quite enjoyed them. But I know a lot of people. I, I I listened to some reviews before this, and I feel like a lot of people are not as cool as us, so to speak, and uh, don't enjoy that sort of thing. Are you are you talking about the the trouble center? Yeah, yeah. Because one of, one of the problems I have with the content, actually, this is the the biggest problem I have. Actually, this might be the biggest problem I have with the whole game, if I'm being honest is um, just the amount of backtracking that I feel like I have to do in yeah. many of the dungeons. Like There were there many parts where, I, and I'm not going to name specific things because, again, you know, spoilers, and I don't want to like send people into the game like, oh, this part's going to suck because Peter said it sucks. <laughs> like I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but there were definitely parts of the game where I'm just going back and forth and back and forth. Like I have to go into this dungeon, uh, be blocked by an obstacle, go out into the t- like the town area, then like have that obstacle lifted, but then there's another obstacle and I have to do the same thing. It's like, holy shit, man, like I just want to kind of get through this. And I think part <laughs> of it is because they designed the maps in such a way that you're never too far from like a save block or a shop. But because of that, they can't add like length to the dungeon because then you're gonna be far away from the from the shop. And I think at the very end of the game they fix this, but for the rest of the game, like you're constantly going back and forth. And I, I just found that really tiresome. And even like the the interludes, not not the interludes between chapters really, but generally before you set off to your next destination, you'll have to do something in Rogueport to gain access to that location. Yeah. And some of those I felt were really lengthy and obscure. Like you know, I had to 
Google what to do because I wasn't sure where to find this one person I need to talk to. And to me, it just kind of ruined the pace because I was really enjoying myself after uh, beating the boss and getting the Crystal Star and all this stuff. And I was like, man, where's the next one? Where's the next one? But instead, I have to do some errand and rogue port. I'm like, yeah, you know. Yeah, um, I agree. So I feel like the that and then the backtracking uh, really did like ruin the pace for me at moments. Not enough to where I dislike the game overall, but there were certainly moments, good chunks of time where I was not having fun. And that's <laughs> uh, definitely not good. <laughs> hmm. It's kind of cool to hear different opinions as well, and I could totally see that. It's just that uh, everything else that this game just does so well that you know really kind of goes above and beyond that for me. Um, so I think by by far and none, in my opinion, the content's the best thing about this game, and it's in my opinion one of the best I think content that the game can have. Period. First off, story. It, this is actually my favorite video game story of all time. Uh, I really do like the call, Peter, to keep this spoiler free review. Uh, because um, with everyone that has not played this yet, uh, please play this game. And when you do, the story is a huge part of that. One of the things I always tell people is that if there's one thing I can do is to play this game over again with no memory of it. I really wish I could do that. Just that first feeling of going through it for the first time. <laughs> uh, it's just truly special. And this is actually one of the few games in my entire life where when the game ended, I was legitimately upset. Not because that I, you know, didn't like the game or you know I was frustrated with the ending, but I was upset that it had to end. And so, at no other video game I could vividly remember giving me that feeling. And so, that's just a props to the game. This game just has so much heart to it. In terms of other things that the content has, um, the characters you kind of alluded to, Peter, has different dialogue and that even affects the story as well, like the main events of the story. So even playing yeah. it through a second time, uh, having a different partner out really kind of changes like the conversations, even in the main story. And it's kind of cool to see how they interact with some of those main characters. Um, and so you kind of get a different experience every time where people get a different experience every time, depending on who they like as a partner more, stuff like that. Uh, there's so many extra things you can do on the side. I totally you know, took advantage of the lottery system, you know, the mini game parlor with uh, all those a uh, bunch of fun mini games that you can do. The recipes, uh, go out of your way for the recipe book. Uh, my brother Steven did every single recipe in this game. He <laughs> set himself up to go out and get every single recipe. And in terms of like the tattle log, Goombella can you know, tell you information about enemy and you can keep track of all of that throughout the game. And it really tells you, you know, in depth about each enemy and stuff like that. And then even the characters. And so... I think the beauty of this game is that species or, you know, different types of enemies or creatures are not inherently good or bad. Each one has their own name, their own story to tell. Um, even Luigi plays a big role in this, or minor role <laughs> in this Luigi's game, really right? Funny. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Even Bowser's hilarious. And not just because he's trying to be funny on purpose, but even Bowser's role is different than usual. And you get to really see that, that... Bowser's role is just really clever. Peach's role is really clever and different. And so a lot of those characters really shine and you get to know those Mario characters much more than you do the main games. Yeah. And so there's just so much you can do. And then there's even an extra difficulty factor. Uh, there's even something called the Pit of 100 Trials. Right. Where um, this was definitely something that I did after I beat the game. So this was something that I was super thankful because after I was upset I beat the game because it was over. You know, at least when I came back and I realized I could still play some more, I was super happy that there was still so much to do. And I was really thankful for that. I think I do want to go back and try the Pit of 100 Trials. I sort of accidentally stumbled upon it earlier in the game, which I think is by design. Um, but I, I was kind of on, not really a time crunch, but you know, when I'm playing these games for the show, I want to kind of be efficient with my time. So I was like, oh, I'll come back to this later. And then, uh, not necessarily for that reason, but also just I happened to not do a lot of the other things that you were talking about, like the Pianta game corner and the uh, the lottery. I totally forgot about the lottery until you mentioned <laughs> it just now. Um, and then the recipes, I just totally ignore the recipes, which 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 I, I feel fine about, honestly, because I don't think they're crucial by any means. I mean, the fact that I enjoy the game thoroughly without them speaks to that, but there really is a lot of additional content that I think you know might not have been a draw for me, but certainly could be a draw for other people. Um, and of course, something like the Pit of a Hundred Trials is definitely more of a uh, more substantive type of content, like that extra challenge. 
So I, I agree that that's really great. Um, this is kind of my last point, actually, is um, just the amount of writing that went into this. Of course, I already spoke about the writing a few minutes ago, but Ryan, when you were talking about the uh, the fact that each party member will have different dialogue during the the main cutscenes, depending on who you have out at the time, uh, I definitely noticed that, and I thought that was a huge, um, just, just like such a great touch of detail, because like I wouldn't have been surprised if they forced a certain party member to come out and talk, like based on who was mm-hmm. most appropriate at the moment or whatever. But they don't force you to do that. They'll just let each character talk uh, naturally, so to speak. And, I mean, just the sheer amount of writing that this game has is staggering. Like, all of Gumbella's titles, not just for the enemies, but also the locations. Like, almost every room you're in in the whole game has its own, like, mm-hmm. you know, Gumbella blurb that she talks about. All the NPCs, or a lot of the NPCs in the game, if not most of them, will have their dialogue change after mm-hmm. certain points. And I was just like blown away by the amount of attention and time that had to go into all that. So really, like huge, huge shout out for me to the writers. Um, sometimes I think they were overindulgent. <laughs> <laughs> there were some parts where uh, I thought there was too much writing. Like, okay, I get it. Like this person's <laughs> been talking for too long. Yeah. Um, also, early in the game, there was I, I was I was prepared for this to be a problem throughout the whole game, yeah. but it was mainly at the beginning where a character will say they're done talking and then they'll say, but wait, stop. And then you'll like trip or something. I was like, dude, just fucking tell me the thing. Like, you don't have to send me away and then call me back. Like that bugs him in real life too. Yeah. Like go to video games to escape reality, not to, (laughs) not to relive it. (laughs) So yeah, sometimes I had too much fun, I think, but, uh, overall I was astounded by that. And so I think even though the game definitely has a lot to offer in terms of game content, uh, definitely the writing and the setting and the story and all that stuff. That That's what really makes it Paper Mario, in my opinion. And that's kind of my uh, my parting words for content. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And to kind of expound on one of the points that you said um, earlier, not too long ago, um, talking at the beginning, I will mm-hmm. say the game starts out very slow because of this reason. There's just like a lot of talking and not yeah. enough like going and doing mm-hmm. something. Agreed. It starts out a lot slower than the other one. Um, and I think this kind of goes into the fact, uh, and it might play into more what I was trying to say with visuals and the world being a little bit more dynamic in the first one, is that the first one, it's more of a world, right? The hub world is not just one place. It's like you go to, the hub world is like the entire world. You go to different sections of this world, whereas this one, it's mostly Rogueport, as Peter was saying earlier, and you have to backtrack to Rogueport to get to each section of the the world. So it's almost like these are extensions of Rogueport, whereas the other one was like it felt like a more complete world. Yeah. Um, so to speak. And so the environments fit a lot better there. And I'm also, this is just personal preference and because I've played the first one, and I know I keep bringing that up, but I wish they'd do some cameos, dang it. They did like two cameos of the characters in the previous game, and they weren't for very long. It's like you hardly would even notice. <laughs> Did we just forget that Mario went oh, on a previous gotcha. adventure already? I felt the same way about the sequel to this game. So, yeah, I actually completely understand that feeling. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> Did you forget everything, that the magical journey I went through of Paper Mario? I do agree with your point about, uh, of course, I don't have the baseline of Paper Mario, uh, or the original Paper Mario, but I do. I did feel that the world felt sort of fractured, which I thought was kind of a missed opportunity. Um, I, I mean, I could see why they would do it, uh, just to kind of like streamline some parts of the game, but I was like, yeah, it'd be cool to see how, uh, you know, Petalburg City or whatever connected to, you know, to Rogueport, because at the very beginning of the game, you get this beautiful map with all these places, and of course it opens up as you play the game, but never does it truly connect. It's like, you know, Rogueport is the... right is like certainly the hub. And I was, I was a little disappointed by that, but not enough to where I was like, this world sucks. It's just kind of like a, a minor disappointment. I guess I have one, I have one last thing just because, uh, you know, we kind of touched on this, you know, in previous episodes, you know, with me saying that this is the first game I suggest that everyone should play. There's kind of confusion with that. So kind of to clarify what I meant by that question, what I asked you guys uh, this is not literally the first video game that someone new should play. I was just saying that this would be, if someone came up to me with, no matter what video game experience they have, they asked me, what game should I play that I haven't played? This would be it. I feel like this is the one game, in my opinion, that every person that you know likes to play video games should play just because 
of you know any skill level can enjoy it. Uh, it it has something for everyone. Um, the story and the heart that's put into this game is just what makes video games great. And I think this game does that so so well. Um, and so that's why that would be my suggestion to someone, uh, to any gamer. Like this is the one game that I personally believe that you should play if you have not already. I think that's a good clarification, and uh, I think I'll, I think I'll mention briefly my overall impressions uh, after we give all of our ratings. So I think now would be a good time to give our content ratings. Um, uh, I don't remember the order, so I'll just go first. <laughs> um, I gave content a hot, fresh ninety. Ninety. Wow, I'm really close to that. Um, I'm at a ninety-one. Dang, you were you weren't lying. <laughs> all right, and I gave mine a ninety-nine. I think it's you know real near. Rear, real near perfect for me. Yep. So, yep. Neo rear perfect. <laughs> Neo rear. Yeah, I know. I deal for real. Pronunciation. Ugh, weird words sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's not too many more words. Uh, we're about to wrap up here. But of course, before we do our wrap up, we have to do some number crunching. So we will get back to you shortly. Everybody, you've come this far. Don't stop now. We're on the home stretch. The season is almost <laughs> over. I promise you. <laughs> we're back from the we're back from the number crunching. Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. Uh, I will recap my ratings first. Gameplay, I gave an eighty. Visuals, I gave a hundo. Audio, I gave an eighty-five. And those two scores together give me an aesthetics rating of uh, ninety-two point five. And then I finished it off with a ninety for content. So all said and done, the Pete Boy score for this game is an eighty-seven point five. Uh, Kev, why don't you follow up? I gave gameplay a 91, uh, visuals an 88, uh, audio an 89, which are aesthetics, is a 88.5 there. Um, content was a 91, bringing my overall score to 90.2. Nice. Sweet. All right. And for me, I had gameplays a 94, uh, visuals is a 92, sounds a 95, which made my aesthetics. Score in 93.5, and my content was a 99, giving my overall score a 95.5. There you go. So just lower than Metroid Prime uh, and higher than my first episode, Zero Mission, which fits in because I always tell people uh, if I had to rank all my games, this is my, I consider this my third favorite video game of all time. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that will bring our IG score to 91.1, which is 10th out of 31 games. So not too shabby. Top 10? Yeah, I think it will, uh, I mean, we've, we've been reviewing some pretty, pretty good games. Um, I don't know if anything will be better than that. At this point, it's getting pretty honed in on what you have to do to eclipse the, the A rating, but, um, I think it did pretty good. Um, interesting to note that, and, and I say this as a little bit of a jab, on Metacritic, um, <laughs> Thousand Year Door is like at an 87, and then uh, Paper Mario 64 is at a 93. Just just throwing that out there. Um, that surprises me because uh, maybe this is like, I don't know where I got this idea, but I was always thinking that this game was the most acclaimed Paper Mario, but according to Metacritic, it's not. So I, I wonder where I got my uh, information from. It's from Ryan. He's been brainwashing you. This is maybe just because of you know people that I've talked to over the years. More people that I talk to usually prefer this game because you brainwash them with your little brain waves, <laughs> corrupt. So maybe I am brainwashed. Your so the phase critic on. score is a little different. You know, my phase on. Yeah, that's it. That was in your phase on. But, um, I don't know. But anyway, hey, I'm not here to throw out opinions. I'm just here to throw out facts. It was six points higher. I don't know what to tell you. Facts don't care about my feelings. <laughs> Can I commission someone to create the fan game Paper Metroid the Thousand Year Phase on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd play right. that. Uh, Can you imagine? Oh yes, in a heartbeat. Paper oh, Samus. Man. Paper, dude, Paper Samus <laughs> would be so sick. Oh my god, I really want someone to do this. Um, <laughs> hey, instead of Morth Ball, it's a Paper Ball. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll write some fan fiction uh, once I have infinite free time. Um, I uh, I definitely enjoyed it for sure. As I said, there were like I, I felt I felt that the game had really high highs and a few sort of low lows. But I did really sure. enjoy it, and I did like the story. I definitely liked some of the characters. Like a few of the characters really did stick with me in particular. I'm not going to say who because hashtag spoiler free ep. 
But um, yeah, I, I would also recommend this game to uh, maybe not every gamer out there, but I think for anyone who is, I would say that the Mario universe has a lot of potential for interesting stories like this, but we don't often see that. And so for anyone who's more interested in like that story element of of the Mario series, I, I would definitely, definitely recommend this. And also, uh, after hearing Kevin, I would also recommend that they play the N64 game, which now I need to do, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would, uh, just to expand upon that, I would say if if given the choice, you should play 64 first because it only makes sense, natural progression. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of weird in, in Ryan's regard that he went from this game, the sequel, to the first one. Of course, it's going to, it's going to, you're going to be like, well, why doesn't it have this, right? So I think it's a more natural transition to go from the first game to the yeah. second. Yeah, don't be so weird, Ryan. Gosh. It's not his fault. He didn't know. I didn't own it in 64. I was a PS1 Excuses, kid. Excuses, whatever. Talk I know, to the hand. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, so. Gotcha. Yeah, no, in conclusion, uh, this game means a lot to not only me, but my brothers as well. Uh, both my brothers would tell you that, you know, they never enjoyed watching me play a video game than this one. And uh, this is actually the only video game where all three of us brothers, that this is our top three video game of all time. You know, a lot of us kind of differ in some of our favorite video games, but this is the one that we all have in common of this is a life-changing video game for us three. So maybe that's another thing that's really special uh, uh, place in my heart with this game. But yeah. Fun for the whole family. Heck yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in to the epic conclusion. Of course, it wouldn't be an epic conclusion without having a guest. And uh, Ryan, we thank you very much for being on the show, uh, especially on a school night. We know you got to get to the kiddos tomorrow morning. Uh, those those crazy <laughs> kids these days uh, doing their vapes and their uh, fidget spinners. <laughs> so uh, definitely lay down the law. Gosh, that is everywhere in high school. Definitely yeah, uh, evangelize Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door to all your newfangled, uh, newfangled kids. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for you know actually including me in uh, season three. And letting me be a part of reviewing one of my favorite games of all time. I can't thank you guys enough. It's been a great yeah. season. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, well, that's going to wrap us up for season three. Hope you've all enjoyed this season. Um, but don't worry your precious little hearts. We will be back for season four. But disclaimer, it won't be until early 2020 because, because, because hey. your boy is getting married soon. Heck yeah. Um, just in a couple Woo-hoo! of months. And yeah. I'm going to be super busy. Um, the second half of the year. So, uh, we got, we got to go to New Orleans. We got to, we got to get married. Then we got, you know, Thanksgiving and all those holidays. And then December with Christmas coming up and maybe Pete coming in, you know, coming in hot. We got a lot going on, but, um, that's not to say that we won't have any bonus episodes or potentially any bonus episodes along the way before season four starts. So look out for that. But, um, just know that season four is, is, it's going to be in the year 2020. I'm thinking January, but who knows? Yeah. Um, so we'll do our usual shout outs before we sign off. Thanks to our patrons, Mallory Sutton, Ryan, your boy, Ryan Everett, who's here with us today. Hey. <laughs> Simon and Seth Webb and, and Z link. And of course, last but not least, my beautiful fiance, Catherine Davis. I was about to say, like, I, I was concerned at the, the skipping of Catherine, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I was like, save the best for less. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. There you go. Yeah, thanks to all of you guys. Um, we hope, of course, you all enjoy the season. If you want to catch up or keep up with the boys uh, during the interim, you can always find us on Twitter primarily, which is the IG underscore cast. We've got some other social media, but y'all, y'all already know. I'm not going to pretend that y'all don't know. But if you must know, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you can listen to us on you know, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, whatever your little heart desires will be there in bulk. And uh, that's pretty much it. I'm done talking. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Thanks for Ryan for appearing. And uh, until next time, love you too. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs>